Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Easy Conversations podcast, a podcast about having easy conversations. I'm your host, Furkan Dandia. In this week's episode, I'm honored to welcome David Rast. David is an Associate Professor of Social Psychology and Leadership at the University of Alberta. David has two primary lines of research drawing extensively on social identity and self-categorization theories and related sub-theories. First, he wants to understand how le- leaders elicit or incite social and organizational change by going against their group's norms. Second, he is interested in understanding how leaders can bridge profound intergroup divisions to build a unified, no identity and achieve a joint goal. Other lines of research are related to these two themes, exploring the processes and implications of political identity, minority influence, deviance, intergroup cooperation, conflict, leader rhetoric, and organizational behavior. David's work is generously supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. David completed his PhD and master's at Claremont Graduate University. He was a pre-doctoral research fellow for the U.S. Army Research Institute's Leader Development Research Unit at Fort Leavenworth in Kansas. Before joining the Department of Psychology at the University of Alberta in 2015, he was an assistant professor at the University of Sheffield's Institute of Work Psychology. David is the associate editor for the Journal of Applied Social Psychology and consulting editor for group processes and intergroup relations. He's appointed to the editorial boards of Self and Identity and the Journal of Theoretical Social Psychology. In 2018, David was elected a Society for Experimental Social Psychology Fellow. In this episode, David and I discuss the aspect of groupthink bias and how our choices and decisions are impacted by the groups we often associate with. We also talk about how leaders use certain messaging to influence people or perhaps even use manipulation. David and I also talk about how we can become more aware of these unconscious biases that may be at play and use critical thinking, which the COVID-19 lockdowns prevented and forced people to have strong attachments with their ideas and opinions and also lead to this divisiveness and polarization that we are currently seeing. I hope you get a lot out of this episode and if you could leave a five-star review at the end, I would truly appreciate it. All right, David, welcome to the Easy Conversations podcast. Thank you for joining me today and taking the time. I'm really appreciative of that and and super grateful. I'm also excited to have a conversation with you uh, for various reasons. But before we get started, I wanted to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and let the listeners know a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do. Of course, and thanks for having me on your podcast. So my name is David Rast. I'm an associate professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of Psychology. And my background is in social psychology. So I study how um, individual or groups are influenced by the presence, whether real or imagined, of uh, other people and how behaviors, attitudes, opinions, and so forth are impacted by the presence, real or imagined, of other people. Very interesting. So... I mean, that's great. And uh, I'm assuming you do a lot of research too, if you're a professor, what is your research primarily based on right now? The bulk of my research is around group processes and social influence. And I focus on leaders and how leaders can influence group members to do good or bad things for groups, whether that's um, being more autocratic and directive or more abusive in their leadership capacity or even reducing prejudice, stereotypes, and discrimination of the group members. So I try to look at both the good and the bad of what leaders can do and how they influence their followers. Right, right. And that's such an interesting topic because especially right now with some of the things we're seeing globally, uh, one of the things I'm very intrigued by and often trying to focus on myself is the polarization we're seeing uh, among society in various parts of the world. And there's often... The way I see it, the responsibility falls on leaders to to be able to guide people and provide direction 
What are your thoughts around some of the challenges we're seeing? And do you tend to agree with the sentiment that there is a great divisiveness or, or polarity within society and amongst people? Um, yeah, we're seeing a growing trend with was particularly political, ideological divides amongst people um, around the world. And it's quite disheartening because oftentimes the, a lay person might think, yeah, leaders are responsible for this. But then when you start asking people like, is Donald Trump responsible for some of the, the dislike or the disagreements that are occurring in the U.S., for instance, or maybe even in Canada between right. Republicans and Democrats or liberals and conservatives, if people say no, but there is a, a great deal of research coming out showing that, yeah, even pretty subtle or innocuous things that Donald Trump says had quite a negative impact for uh, Democrat perceptions of Republicans or vice versa, or even liberal perceptions of conservatives in Canada. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the other way around. For sure, for sure. And I think there's a documentary that came out in Net on Netflix uh, a few years ago, post Trump's election win in 2016. And what I found interesting without getting into too many details is obviously with social media right now, it's easy for us to understand what people's likes and dislikes are. And it's mm -hmm. often that can be used to manipulate people where to your point, it's, if it's the subtle cues, if it's the subtle words that leaders are using, or even people in general are using to appeal to people's likes and dislikes that can influence their behavior in a certain way. What are your thoughts around that? Because I think that's kind of dangerous. And even though I'm aware of it myself, I feel like I can also right. be subject to it. Right. And you see that a lot, even with the algorithms that are on social media that keep sending you advertisements or information based on your behavior. Yeah. So a couple of things that we can unpack there, the First, that interests me is people often think that they're immune to social influence attempts or persuasive appeals that are targeting them, uh, but we're not. And we're not really good at understanding how we respond to these different things because we're not always aware that we even notice them. Right. And we're hit by thousands of advertisements and persuasive appeals every day and we don't realize it. But I think if we just look to children, we can see just how persuasive these appeals are for us. And ask any kid around Christmas time, what sort of toys they want. And somehow there seems to be an agreement that these are the desirable toys for any given year. Right. And it's the advertisements that are doing that. It's not like kids just wake up and suddenly want these toys. Right. It's the advertisements. It's talking to other people. It's their own group memberships, whether it's preschool or elementary school or what have you, um, that are driving some of these attitudes that they have. Um, so we are definitely more influenced and uh, possibly persuaded by these different appeals that we um, see, whether consciously or unconsciously. Um, but when it comes to the language that leaders use, we're not just influenced directly by what they say. So one example of this is in uh, some of my own research, we looked at how Trump's rhetoric and other political leader rhetoric um, impacts people's perceptions of a focal group and a message. So like Trump, say, targeting um, Muslims with a Muslim registry in the United States. And so we looked at what's the direct effect for Democrat and Republicans attitudes toward Muslims and the Muslim registry, but also what are their attitudes for other groups of people like women, um, like atheists and so on. And what we found was that not only was there a negative impact on the focal group for like Republicans disliking Muslims more or being more supportive of a Muslim registry, but they also disliked women more. Um, they were less likely to support women's rights. They were less likely to support Black Lives Matters and so on. And it, so it's not just the focal group where we see this negative attention geared toward. We're seeing it across other related groups too, or other social movements as well. Right, right. So on the first point, as you said, like whether, I'll come back to both, but when you mentioned around the, the whole concept and using ch children as an example, there's the conscious and unconscious tendency to fall towards certain things uh, and we're obviously not immune to it what are some things people can do to become more aware because obviously we're I, I don't want to say we're being programmed almost on a daily basis but it does feel like that at times so 
based on the work you do, what are some things people can do to become more aware of some of this subtle stuff that's happening under the surface? Uh, I'm not really sure if there's much people can do. There's a whole line of research looking at how to be less persuaded by things or what we call resistance. So how can you be more resistant to a persuasive appeal yeah. or more resistant to certain kinds of social influence attempts? And it's, it's really difficult because there are, are so many. So if we look just at social influence, for instance, um, you have different kinds of conformity. So if a group of people are just standing downtown looking up at the sky, other people are going to start looking up too. And there's not really much going on there. Like it's not harmful to do that. But when you start looking at like peer pressure, for instance, how can you be less resist or more resistant to peer pressure, less influenced by it? And some of that is just understanding that you are susceptible to peer pressure and right. being able to recognize that there are certain people who are going to pressure you or not pressure you in your groups um, and trying to get away from that. But I think when it comes to social influence attempts, because those tend to be quite subtle, it's really difficult for people to get away from those. But when it comes to persuasive appeals, which is usually trying to change someone's attitude about something. So to get someone to go, say, pro-life to pro-choice, for instance, um, it's much easier to be resistant to these sort of things because we're, we can be more aware that they're occurring or that we know someone's trying to change our attitude about something. Um, but again, one of the first steps is just recognizing that you are susceptible to these things and that people are trying to influence or persuade you and just being on the lookout for it. And if you do notice that someone is trying to persuade you, you can put up your own barriers. So counter argue mentally, maybe why you know, you don't agree with that person's opinion. Right, right. And what you're alluding to in a certain capacity is also groupthink bias, right? So being aware of that in terms of even your own social circle um, and, and some of the things that you may be gravitating towards and trying to understand why. Uh, I think there, one of the things I realized during the whole pandemic was also this inability of people to utilize critical thinking, right? And I think one of the things I like to think in terms of the ability to become not only become aware of some of these influencing tactics, but also try to counter them is through critical thinking and often trying to understand why are we doing the things we do more from a behavioral aspect and often even questioning our own choices and beliefs. Just wanted to put that out there and, and get your thoughts on the whole notion of groupthink bias and our, I think in general, as a society, we've lost our capability to utilize critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when it comes to a phenomena like groupthink, if we do have someone who's a, a gadfly, someone who's really going against the rest of the group. Whether they agree with it or not, just someone who's standing up and pointing out flaws, it does help reduce conformity. It does help reduce some of the social pressure around what we call group thing. And it can reduce the likelihood of a group coming to some sort of stupid decision. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it seems like there's not a lot of people who are willing to stand up and go against the group, right. whether they agree with the group or not. And just say, hey, maybe this is problematic and we should take a step back and really think critically about it or even just slow down and see if this is the right decision. Um, I've noticed over the last like maybe eight years or so, there seems to be a lot more social pushback on, I guess, what we think of as like intellectual elitism. But at this point, it's more of like intellectual mediocrity. Right. Like just even having an original thought or being critical is sort of like, frowned upon it seems right and so just people willing to stand up and have a critical thought and share that with other people um seems to be hit with a lot of backlash particularly around political divides and so people will just you know stand up speak their mind say what's going on um maybe we could see a reduction in conformity or the different group think phenomenon that you're describing for sure yeah and i mean it takes a lot of courage to step up and speak against conventional wisdom or even question status quo because there's that risk as you mentioned of being ostracized or the whole notion of whistleblowing too right and i've seen i mean when i was doing my engineering i, I watched this movie with al pacino and russell uh russell crowe where it was called a whistleblower and his 
Russell Crowe whistle blows and his whole life is destroyed. So even from a societal perspective, you're kind of told that, hey, if you're going to stand up and speak up against something that perhaps even goes against your own values and feels ethically wrong, you're going to have a price to pay, which makes a lot of people fearful to, to, to even speak their mind. There's a, a whole lot of pressure from the group to conform and fit in. And if you don't, that's one of the ways that we punish people and get them back in line. And um, it's it's quite powerful. There's some research coming out of Kip Williams Research Lab at uh, Purdue University where he shows that being ostracized or excluded from a group has not only psychological pain associated with it, but actually physical pain where people might report pain on par with like going to the dentist and having a root canal as yeah. just from being excluded from their groups. You know, that's a difficult thing to overcome. Like that's a painful thing and it doesn't just go away like your regular pain might. Absolutely. I, and I, I can see truth to that because there is significant downside to being kind of excluded for sure. And, and you're seeing that a, li lo a little bit with the whole cancel culture, right? If you don't agree, you get canceled and then you're basically wiped out. And to your point, that can be significant, right? And I've heard stories of people that have been canceled and what they've been able to equate it to in certain instances is almost like death, right? You, you no longer exist, even mm -hmm. though you do, right? So it's, I could see the challenge there, um, especially around speaking up and, and stating your truth. Yeah, it does seem like it would be difficult, especially with the cancel culture mentality that we're seeing right now. I would like to see more people standing up for what's right and their own values. But, you know, I study group processes. So sometimes I get a little disheartened when I see just how difficult it is to, to break away from that mold and, and do what, what you believe is right. Because yeah. I do understand the, the psychological and the physical pain that people go through to do that, especially if it's a really important group to them, like a, a family group or right. a group that they've been in for a really long time or even a career. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I've noticed too, working with clients as well is they are struggling and it's fairly consistent, struggling even to fit in with their families post pandemic, right? I find a lot of people, whether it was pandemic related or some of the political ideologies that are coming out, not a lot of people even see eye to eye with their family members. And that's created a lot of rift and and often it's impacted their relationships, not only with friends and family. So I could see the impact of that too, because a lot of people carry that burden of losing close connections that they used to have. Yeah. And what I described for being excluded or ostracized from groups, uh, you can see it. If you look back at COVID too, with people being isolated, whether government mandated isolation or just met like isolating themselves um, because they're single or maybe they're a part of a, a couple that cohabitates and they can't go out and mingle with other people. And so just being completely isolated and alone and separate from your friends and your family and your loved ones and only being able to connect virtually, um, if at all, um, it's easy to see how that sort of isolation could result in feeling that psychological and that physical pain of being excluded from your groups, even just ignoring the the political divisions that you mentioned or some of the other things going on in society. Right. And one of the things I came across coming back to critical thinking uh, during the pandemic uh, around the idea of because you were excluded socially and you were kind of isolated, whether you were with your significant other or your just immediate family or just on your own, you weren't given the opportunity to go out and have conversation with friends or, or other people socially where you could be challenged in your way of thinking. So you're almost sitting at home having this thought, which you potentially would go on social media or online to look up and the algorithms would only reinforce your belief. And because you weren't being challenged, you almost continued down that rabbit hole and form these strong beliefs. Um, is that something you've been able to research or at least come across in your work? Or do you even see some truth to it? No, I, I don't research that. Um, I believe 
that there are some psychologists looking at that. Um, I think maybe a J band bubble at NYU has done some research on that, looking at, um, Twitter post yeah. and Facebook posts, or at least one of his former grad students was doing something similar to that. I think, um, yeah, I haven't really stayed up on the research too closely in that area because it's not stuff that I do research on right. and it's still a, a newer area. There's a, a ton of research coming out on COVID and the effects of COVID on um, individuals, on groups and on families and stuff. And so right now we're just seeing sort of the, the beginning waves of that still. Right. Right. But I think even outside of COVID with some of the ways people are nowadays validating their own thought processes and, and again, you know, if you, if you look something up and the algorithms are just going to reinforce your way of thinking, I, I could see some challenges around that too. Right. Yeah. And there is some research showing that the way our brain works when we see information, politi particularly political information, we start thinking in terms of left and right divide. So we start thinking in terms of liberal conservative divide quite quickly, and then categorizing that information as either being similar to our group's beliefs or not similar to our group's beliefs, and very quickly making snap judgments about whether or not we agree with or oppose that and like or dislike people because of their group memberships or their opinions based on what we perceive their political ideology to be. Huh. Interesting. I, I did want to come back to the whole idea of leadership, whether it's from a political perspective or, or not, and some of the influencing that happens. Uh, just wanted to expand on that a little bit because we touched on it briefly in terms of some of the subtle cues and and some of the challenges that we're seeing and and the divide, whether you're you're liberal or conservative or, or I guess democratic or, or Republican. There's so what what I struggle with is the extreme aspect of it, right? And I believe the truth is always somewhere down the middle. And I think that's kind of how we need to approach things. But what are your thoughts around that? And, and why is there such a push on the extremes where people don't seem to find any mutual agreement or, or any areas to be able to say, yeah, you know, I could see some overlap and, and come to some sort of agreement. So there's a, there's a phenomenon in group processes and intergroup relations research that's been studied for a really long time and it's called in-group favoritism. And so when we are part of a group and we perceive ourselves as being in that group, we tend to favor our own group, mm. but we not only favor our own group. We also try to differentiate our, our group from another group. And so we try to maximize the similarity within our own group or the perceived similarity within our own group. So we think everyone in our group is really similar to us, right? Or we're really similar to everyone in the group. But when it comes to the, what we call the out group, the other group, we view them as being vastly different from us. Mm. And so we try to maximize our differences from that other group while minimizing differences within our own group. And. This can lead to some of the, the polarization that you're describing, um, sort of going to the extreme, thinking of the other group as being extremely different from us. Um, and what we see, or at least sort of anecdotally, what I see going on with political groups, not just in the U S and Canada, but around the world are the groups that seem to be on the left and the right are really pushing those differences as much as possible. Right. So. They want to position one group as being as different as possible, or the leader from the other group as being as different as possible, as extreme as possible, so that they're not supported by the, the moderates in the middle. Because huh. those are the people who really decide who wins or loses the election. Right. There's not a lot of people on the extremes, on the fringes. It's the people in the middle who are dictating the outcomes of the elections so, more often than not. So if we can paint our political rival as being a really extreme fringe person, they're less likely to get those votes that are needed. Uh, but also it helps us with our own group because it's making our group look better or different from the other group too. So we're saying, Hey, we're all similar and we're better or different from this other group. Right. Right. And you could see some of that happening even in religious institutions or even social classes. Right. And uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. It's not just in politics. You see it across 
a whole host of, of different aspects of society. And we do this, I mean, it's, it's seemingly n- like not an issue in certain areas like sports, for instance, like you're in Calgary, I'm in Edmonton. And last year we had the battle for Alberta yeah. in the playoffs. And it was a, a big deal for us in the province. And it was sort of goofed on by the local media and stuff. And even I was interviewed by, by people around Canada for the battle of Alberta. And it was kind of a joke, like these two teams are going at it. They really dislike each other and stuff. And it was a friendly competition, a friendly battle for Alberta, but it, it's not really within the province. Like this joke is taken seriously too. Like whoever wins is like the leader of Alberta. Yeah. We're the better group and Calgary and Edmonton already have that weird divide going on of like, which one's better, which one brings in more money and stuff. Um, so even if you look at something like sports groups where you see these rivalries and you don't think they're a big deal, they're actually still producing intergroup conflict and intergroup disagreement where you are seeing groups maximizing differences between themselves. And it, it's leading to other negative consequences like willingness to um, avoid people from that other group right. or um, more conflict or more disagreement, things like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's really cooperate. For sure. And it's interesting you mentioned that because, you know, we talked about children earlier and it's funny, my son's uh, an Edmonton Oilers fan. And, you know, even during the playoffs last year, if he saw anyone even wearing a Calgary Flames jersey or a hat or any form of memorabilia, he would immediately have this opinion of them. And he's only, I mean, last year he was only nine. But even for a child to start picking up on those things and start having those unconscious biases is almost troublesome to see. Um, and, you know, again, he's just a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm from Chicago and we have the Cubs and the Sox, the White Sox, and it's a big rivalry for us in baseball. And part of my family, I guess almost everyone in my family is a Cubs fan and then I'm a Sox fan. And I won't even go to Wrigley Field. I won't touch foot on Wrigley property. Like it runs deep in me and I study this stuff for a living. Yeah, which goes back to the whole idea of you saying that a lot of it happens on an unconscious basis too, right? We're, we're not even aware of it. So that's just important to, to understand. Um, there was another thing you mentioned that people try to almost convince themselves that they're not susceptible to these things and often that's i i believe that's a delusion because like we said it can happen on an unconscious basis but there's often from a behavioral aspect there is that reinforcement that happens too right whether it's being included in a group or being feeling like you're part of a community and as social beings we have this desire for connection Do you feel that a lot of that plays in as well from a almost a primal aspect that often can be used to manipulate individuals as well? Yeah, it definitely can. I'm not too familiar with a lot of the evolutionary perspectives in psychology. They tend to come down to just men wanting to mate and procreate as much as possible and women wanting like stability and a single mate. Um, so I tend to stay away from it because I don't like those sort of explanations. Right. Um, but there's, there's definitely, uh, a more primal innate, instinctual part of humans to coalesce with other people, right? Whether it's in small groups or in large groups and, uh, yeah, we definitely do it for survival reasons, but also like we need other people to survive. We're not capable of doing it on our own. Absolutely. We didn't evolve in a way where we can just be on our own, like a badger or something running around in the wild. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's part of it too, right? It, having that sense of belonging, which can often influence us too, to almost share those beliefs. Um, even though, you know, we talked about this whole notion of people feeling isolated or, or secluded, but there's still often the. I guess you, you can still feel connected to something, even if you're secluded, right? If you believe that I have, I share these values with these people. Um, and I think a part of it, that's where I feel like a lot of that manipulation is happening, where 
you know, if you have that sense of belonging, then you may have those shared beliefs as well. And, and the reason why I bring that up is one of the things I've talked about as well in the past is a lot of men that often get gravitate towards gangs or cults or stuff like that is based on that shared belief and that sense of belonging. And, and that can also influence their behavior and choices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if we look at the leadership literature on leader rhetoric, there's some really interesting research that's looking at the most powerful words that leaders can use and the least powerful words leaders can use. The most powerful words a leader can use are us and we. Mm-hmm. The least powerful words are me and I. And so it's really getting at what you're saying of feeling, or at least trying to make our followers feel or make their followers feel like they are part of the same group. So we're in this together. And you see a lot of leaders who don't have any real knowledge of psychology or group processes, or maybe even leadership theory, using this sort of language. They're really going out and making people feel like they belong. They're part of the team. Um, you saw Obama do it a ton. If you look at his speeches, it's we all over the place. And he really uses me or I. Um, if you look at even Trump right now running for president again, there's a lot of I language, but there's also a lot of we're in this together. I think recently he gave a, a talk at CPEC where he said that uh, liberals are coming after the conservatives, but he's the one standing in the way protecting them at the moment. And he's the savior of the group. And so still really getting at this notion of we're a group, we're all in this together. It's not just me. I just happen to be the one everyone's coming after for you first. Right, right. And I don't know if you studied any of the kind of the the Nazi movement back in the day, but I think there was an aspect of that too with Hit, the way Hitler was talking to people and the way he was able to get such a following too, right? Was that same divide and same language that you're alluding to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with, with people looking at Hitler's language, uh, but from what I know about it, it does seem to align with that. Um, but we see it with a lot of leaders throughout history where their language has been studied in depth, like doing content analysis, just looking at individual words or phrases that leaders are using. And so they're really successful ones over the years. Um, have used more we language than I language. Uh, most of this research has looked at U.S. presidents throughout the history of the United States, more so than other leaders. Uh, so I'm not sure how common it is in other cultures. I do know, for instance, Gandhi used a lot of collective language rather than individual language. Uh, but that's about my extent outside of the U.S. presidents. Right, right. The yeah. Of knowledge there. Yeah, and I mean, we've kind of focused on the negative aspects of it too, but from a leadership standpoint, there is that positive spin as well, right? Where, again, you use Gandhi as an example, it's having people buy in, but you almost have to lead by example and try to figure out, okay, is there an aspect of personal gain behind the message? And that's often hard to to decipher because often these leaders or individuals are very charismatic mm-hmm. reason. Hey. Yeah. Um, so what you said is really interesting because as we perceive a leader to be, uh, oh, the word we use in my area of research is called prototypicality, so prototypical. And all this really means is it's sort of a, a strange word for saying that someone is perceived as being more representative of the group. Mm-hmm. So you think about a, a category, for instance, like Republican, who's like the first person to come to mind. Usually it'll be someone like Ronald Reagan, or if you're thinking conservatives, it might be Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Um, in Canada, maybe it'll be someone like Harper, for instance. Yeah. And so when you, when I'm talking about prototypicality, I'm really talking about those people who sort of come up in the different attributes that these individuals possess. And so, um, as a group, we're comparing our leaders against these other more representative people of our group. So like, what's the, uh, the most representative leader of our group would look like Ronald Reagan if we're conservative. Right. And so how closely does this person sort of match Ronald Reagan's beliefs and opinions and attitudes? And so the more that leader seems to fit this representative nature of our group, the more likely we are to also attribute them as being similar to us. And 
we also attribute their own motives as being group focused rather than personal focused. Mm -hmm. So we actually perceive them as doing things in the group best interest rather than for their own self-interest. And the less representative the leader is, the more we perceive them as doing stuff in their own interest rather than in the group's best interest. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just in politics. This is like group leadership, very broadly speaking. Um, even there's a guy named Dom Abrams in England who was just knighted recently, I believe. Um, he's a social psychologist and he was doing research looking at this and found that even soccer captains, football captains, who scored the final goal but had a penalty called against them that reversed the final goal, uh, if they were perceived as being more representative of their group, were seen as committing the penalty in the group's best interest to win the game. Right even though they lost. Whereas if the group leader was less representative, they were perceived as doing it, trying to get all the glory for winning the game. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you can see that in organizations as well within where leaders are, again, if they're attributing the success to the group or, or themselves, or again, if they're looking out for their best interests. And I think a lot of CEOs get a lot of heat based on that too, because of their bonuses, right? Yeah. 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 When I teach my undergraduate course on leadership, one of the things I like to point out is that we often attribute group success and failure to the group's leader, even when they're not necessarily responsible for any of it. So one of my favorite examples is Steve Jobs. Mm. There's a whole notion that Steve Jobs is responsible for like the, the technological innovations of Apple, like the iPhone and the iPad and the really thin Mac computers that exist now. And it's like, no, he was just the CEO. He was trying to get people to invest in the company. He wasn't on the engineering team. He didn't have any real say in what the engineers were doing. I guess he did as the CEO, but he wasn't like on the team working on these products. He wasn't prototyping them or anything like that. And in fact, a lot of the information that we've learned about Steve Jobs before he passed away and then after he passed away was that he was kind of a dick to his followers, to his, his company members. Yeah. Um, of throwing the first prototype iPhone at them, for example, and telling them to fix the fucking phone and make it thinner or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so when we think about leaders as being good or bad or being successful or not successful, it's oftentimes attributed to things that are outside of the leader's control entirely. Right. And in that Steve Jobs example, I do find that interesting because you're right. He wasn't, you know, what we're talking about so far charismatic in that sense where he wasn't well liked but one of the things that stood out for me personally was his vision right and his ability not to take no for an answer and almost pushing people do you feel like that as we've talked about earlier is you know we were talking about going against conventional wisdom or or thinking up differently from the group that to me feels like there was an aspect of success based on his ability to see things differently and, and question what the group was saying. You know, often the engineers would come say, we can't do this in this many days. He's like, well, you will. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So what you're getting at is what we think of as organizational change and innovation. And so these are sort of two sides of the same coin. And one of the things that we study in my lab is group and social and organizational change. And there's a ton of research looking at organizational change. And there doesn't really seem to be any real rhyme or reason for why it works or doesn't work at times. Mm -hmm. If we look at the, the broad literature on it. And so in my lab, one of my students is looking at how can leaders use their rhetoric and different in things in the social context or the environmental context to facilitate successful organizational change. Mm -hmm. And once that change occurs, how do we keep it? Right. And then how do we innovate on that change in the future? And I don't think there's yet like a clear answer on how we go about doing this. So one of the things we're looking at in my lab is how leaders can use group oriented language to facilitate social and organizational change. So, um, for instance, when we see a leader or a new leader is promoted into a leadership position, they will often come in and say that a whole lot of change needs to occur. We see this particularly in the organizational domains. Yeah. And the very first response we see from people is resistance to change. Mm -hmm. Humans are naturally resistant to change. We like stability. We like reliability and consistency. We don't want change. So oftentimes leaders will come in, promote this 
ridiculous, absurd, really big change. It, it might happen for a little bit and then it goes away. The leader's out. Another leader comes in, does the same thing. Um, so what my grad student is looking at is how can leaders use group oriented rhetoric to try to promote the group's identity moving forward? So it appears consistent while still changing what needs to be changed to move forward. Um, so trying to keep as much consistency as possible with this is who we are, this is who we've always been, but here are the changes we're going to make moving forward. And it's still consistent with who we've always been. Right. Um, I think a political example is probably easier to understand. So, um, there's most countries you see a pro choice, pro life sort of divide between the left and the right. Yeah. So as a new political leader, you can't come in as a liberal and say, we're pro life and we're not pro choice any longer. Right. Most left leaning groups are never going to accept that sort of change. So instead they have to come in and, and make changes that are more consistent with the group. So we're going to stay pro choice, but we're also going to recognize that there's these other things going on and we're going to incorporate that as part of our group identity moving forward. And that's, um, so far, according to the research, it seems to be a way to elicit group change, um, over a longer term period of time. Right. And. Do you feel like that happens frequently or that's, I mean, that's probably, I mean, it makes sense to me to bring about change, but I don't feel like it happens necessarily in practice. Um, so it, it does. And oftentimes when it does, it's also including nostalgia with it. Mm. Although right now that's something that my, my student is looking at as well. And so, for instance, Donald Trump, make America great again, yeah. is doing something that I just described. So he's using nostalgia to try to say, here's what the group is. Here's what our identity is. We need to bring the group back in line with this former identity that made us so great in the past. Right. And while doing so, ignoring all the larger issues with what that means of like whitewashing culture or ignoring people from other nationalities or races or social economic status or what have you. Um, and so oftentimes leaders do do this, but it's, it's quite simplified. And again, we don't always notice when they're doing it. Hmm. Interesting. And along the same lines around nostalgia and, and I'm assuming there's an aspect of beliefs there that are taking place. Like do you, or are you able to perhaps explain how those belief systems then impact people's behaviors? Uh, the belief systems about their groups or just yeah. politics in general? Well, I think um, in general, like, I think I feel like, you know, if you have a certain set of beliefs, then you start be behaving in that sense, right? Oh, absolutely. So, um, from my area of scientific training and what I do research on everything. It's all about group memberships. Mm -hmm. And so the crux of everything that I do in my professional life is mm -hmm. with the assumption that people belong to groups, mm -hmm. at least one group, but you know, humans belong to tons of groups usually. Right. And we vary on a continuum, or at least our group memberships vary on a continuum of how strongly or weakly do we identify with these groups. So how important or unimportant are these different groups to us? Right. And if I was to ask a question to you or anyone listening to the podcast of who are you? Like, just take out a sheet of paper and just make a list of who are you? Yeah. The first couple of things that we see people list are group memberships. So people will tend to write things like their gender category. So male, female, man, woman, right away, or they'll write a, uh, ethnicity, nation of origin, things right away, or even career profession. So student, professor, mm -hmm. um, engineer, counselor, that sort of stuff. Uh, and it's not until they get down to the fifth or sixth item on the list, or maybe even beyond that, where they start writing what people would traditionally think of as a personality difference. So I'm introverted, extroverted, and so on. Right. So it's a lot of the group memberships that come first. And then we start thinking about ourselves as unique individual after that. Right. And so the premise of everything that I do research on is that our members, our group memberships are important to us to some extent. Mm -hmm. And that extent is driven by the context. So we're talking about politics right now. So maybe both of our political identities are more important to us right now, or 
Um, let's say you were to walk into a room full of, of women, maybe your gender or sex identity would be salient to you. First, walking into a room full of men, maybe some other identity would be salient to you at that time. Right. So just for me, that's the premise of everything that I do professionally and all the research I do and everything I write about. So when I think about political groups, political groups are usually quite important to people and given their salience, they're everywhere. Right. Like you can't look at the news without seeing something about politics, especially over the last decade or so, maybe even longer than that. Um, and it's not just us or Canadian politics, but from all over the world, we're seeing, we're just being attacked with what's happening on the left and right in any country. Right. And so whatever is sailing to us in terms of group memberships and those group memberships are important to us, then they start driving our behavior. So we're categorizing ourselves as being left-leaning or right-leaning. And then this is driving the way that we're interacting with people. We're right away starting to categorize other people as, are they part of our same group? So are they left or right? And if they're part of the same group, we treat them more positively. We like them more. We view them as similar to us. We view them as more socially attractive and so on. And if they're different from us, we right away don't like them. And we think that they're, they're less than us or worse than us or different than us. Uh, we view them as dissimilar to us. We don't want to interact with them. We'll, we might even actively avoid them. <laughs> yeah. And so these group memberships run deep in us. And I mentioned earlier that there's some neurological research looking at the political brain and like the left and the right. And so our group memberships aren't just based on these political ideologies, it's group memberships in general. So our brain is sort of divided in this in group, out group sort of divide. We're right away classifying people as are they similar to us or different from us? And then that's driving not only our behavior with that individual, but also our behavior in the broader sense of just interacting with people or how we present ourselves. So like even right now, like you're wearing a baseball cap demonstrating your group membership for whatever the baseball team is, right? Yeah. You're showing people that you're a part of that fan group. Uh, we talked earlier about, I live in Edmonton, you live in Calgary. So again, group memberships right away and right. flames, oilers. So a lot of the conversations that we have or the way that we present ourselves to other people is based on our group memberships. Yeah, absolutely. Signaling whether we're part of someone's in-group or out-group. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, to your point, it, it's very salient and, and a lot of it is often even happens on, on the, the visible memberships right it's like to your point my baseball hat or even like my skin color right if someone were to see me and they'd be like immediately make an assumption that oh this guy is has this ethnic background i might share something with them and and then behave a certain way and i find that's often very superficial because you know to your point if we share political views with someone we may treat them preferentially and then later find out that person is not even a good person or, or it's just a complete jerk. And, and we really don't have much in common with them other than potentially our political views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one phenomenon in social psychology is called the fundamental attribution error. Yeah. Where we tend to overemphasize individual differences and minimize contextual differences. And oftentimes group memberships will fall into that contextual difference part too. So if we see someone and we don't like them, we might minimize personal differences if they're part of the same in-group as us. Right. So that we can still view them positively, where if they're an out-group member, we might actually overemphasize group membership things and think, oh, it's because they're a part of that group. And we'll, we'll minimize the individual difference part there too. Right. Right. It's sort of a reverse attribution error that can be going on for people, depending on if we're thinking about them as exemplars of the group or not. Yeah. Yeah. And, and another thing I've been trying to put a lot of thought into is often our behaviors also determine where we're focusing our attention. And I haven't been able to properly formulate all that, but I wanted to get your thoughts in terms of if we're behaving a certain way, then we're also focusing on certain things that could be misleading or not appropriate and, and how to become more conscious of that. Yeah, I think humans are really bad at that in general. <laughs> so one of the coolest things about human behavior to me is that it's hard to predict what people are going to do. And in fact, it's so difficult to predict that we have something in psychology called the attitude behavior inconsistency. Mm -hmm. 
So just because someone reports a set of attitudes doesn't necessarily mean that their behaviors align with those attitudes. Right. And there are different ways that we can try to figure out what and predict people's behaviors based on attitudes, but it, it's, it's quite difficult to do because people aren't necessarily aware of what their attitudes are. And oftentimes we'll make differences about our own attitudes or other people's attitudes based on their behaviors. Right. Right. And again, those attitudes and the behaviors might be and can be inconsistent with what's actually going on. There's any, there's any. And I find like that it's, that's an interesting phenomenon, especially when people are doing like personality tests too, right? Like they may respond based on how they want to be, but not how they actually are. Or to, to your point, in terms of even the attitudes, it's like, okay, well, this is an attitude that might be favorable. So it's something I'm going to adopt, but then the behavior may not be consistent with that attitude. Yeah. Um, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, his name is Justin Hackett. He's a, a professor in the United States and he did some research and he found a phenomenon that he called the diversity paradox. Mm. And he found that in doing research on a, a group of m more liberal individuals that they reported a really valuing diversity. And that's kind of normal, like it's intuitive. We expect that given what we know about liberals and conservatives. Um, but the reason he called it the diversity paradox is in his research, he found that people who perceive themselves are reported as being more supportive of diversity and finding diversity to be more important and valuing diversity. They actually surrounded themselves with homogenous groups of people. Yeah. So they only wanted to be around like-minded others and they didn't really seem to want diverse groups around them or that diversity in their own groups or close proximity to them. And I think this is sort of getting at what you're talking about of uh, this inconsistent behavior and, and stuff. And I don't think people are always aware of it because even if people are reporting it, we like diversity, we value diversity, we want more diversity, but then they're going out of their way to surround themselves with only like-minded others. Right. Or even what you mentioned earlier about like people going online and, and the algorithms presenting them with information that's consistent with their own attitudes and beliefs. Uh, so. People don't really get to see the other side, the, the other attitudes, the things that are a discrepant with their own beliefs and values. Um, or if they do, they're just ignoring it and going right back to the homogenous groups. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an issue in general, right? And, and I guess one of the things is just at least what I try to remind myself and it's tough <laughs> is that I don't know everything i don't obviously i don't have all the answers and and just being open to different perspectives and again a lot of it happens on an unconscious basis that i may my biases are always kicking in and i'm most often than not not even aware that that's happening right and it's it's such a, a battle every day especially in today's world where we're just constantly inundated with information and just things being thrown at us Oh yeah. And if you ever want to have a little bit more insight into that, you can look up something called the implicit association test by IET, uh, developed by some researchers at Harvard, and they post all different kinds of implicit associations that you can test for yourself to see where your unconscious biases might exist and impact your decision-making in the future. Yeah, I think I've done it similar to that. It's very informative because, I mean, again, you have to be very receptive to the answers that you're going to get. And often the struggle is people don't want to know the truth either, right? Yes. And uh, if I teach a social psych class for undergrads, I'll make my students as an assignment do an implicit association test. But I tell them they can only do it on age or uh, weight. Mm. And so... Uh, there's a, a lot of research looking at people's own biases against age and weight. And so even overweight people, for instance, tend to um, be biased towards skinnier people and skinnier people tend to be biased towards skinnier people. And younger people are valued by societies, at least in Western cultures. And so we do tend to see a preference uh, consciously and unconsciously for younger people over older people. Right. And so even there where I'm picking two IETs where there's a lot of research and also just explicit discrimination toward people who are overweight or elderly people. 
Um, I still have students arguing about how, no, the test is wrong. They don't really value younger people over older people or skinny people over heavier people and so on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I had to do one for, for cultural aspects because of a class I was doing. And as a therapist or at least training to become one, it's important to have awareness because that can be huge, especially when you're working with clients and your biases are impacting your ability to, to support them and kind of use different interventions when, when you're working with them, especially if, if it's uh, cultural aspects and, and how those can impact your ability to show up. But yeah, and I think having just tunnel vision or putting on blinders to your own biases can definitely negatively impact you and let those biases creep in even more just by being dishonest with yourself or being less self-aware. So it's like for what you said, for instance, like it doesn't make you racist or sexist if some of those biases creep in. It's just there are unconscious biases that you may or may not know that you have and you may not even be aware that they're impacting your behaviors or your thoughts. Absolutely. Um, as you're working with a client. And so just being aware of those things and being able to offset them as best you can, it's not making you a good person or a bad person to have these biases. And I think a lot of people do start attaching like stigma or judgment to different biases that they hold. And that's again, one of the things I really like about psychology and social psychology is that just because people hold an attitude or a bias, for instance, it doesn't mean it's going to impact their behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you score really high on uh, some part of the IET, like the ones that I mentioned, like, let's say you score really biased toward overweight people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you dislike overweight people or anything. It's just saying that there's this unconscious bias that you might have. And so think about maybe how you can offset it. Right. So it's, it's not a, a good or a bad thing. It's just, how do you use it? It doesn't mean you've gone through your whole life mistreating people who are heavier. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think another thing to be mindful of is like, it's okay to change your opinions and beliefs and there's nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of people struggle with that because they try to get fixated to their beliefs and, and then try to compensate for that because of how it may come across. But I think it's almost a sign of courage and, and vulnerability to be able to be open about change and, and then respectfully share that. Um, Great. There's a concept in social psychology that gets talked about a lot and it's usually misused and that's cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And one of the interesting things with cognitive dissonance is it's once you've engaged in a behavior and you have to reconcile that behavior with your own personal attitudes or beliefs, you can't really change the behavior because you've already engaged in it. So you have to go back and like post hoc change your attitude to, so that can be more consistent with your behavior. And it seems like people might be doing that in some cases, particularly when they are inundated with lots of information. Well, I must be you know, a really staunch conservative if all these ads are showing up and that's all I'm seeing are these conservative ads or the other side, like I'm yeah. really liberal because I'm only seeing these liberal ads. Right. So it just really gets you ingrained in that group membership and those attitudes that you think that group membership has. Right. And then I guess alternatively, it's being able to question those attitudes and then adjust your behavior accordingly, right? If, if you don't align with those attitudes. Presumably, but again, people are very good at doing that. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, uh, David, I, I'm being mindful of time here. I do want to thank you again for coming on here and sharing a lot of the stuff you did share and some of the research you've been able to come across. Uh, one of the things I've gathered from this conversation is that there's so much going on below the surface that we're not even aware of. And it's given me a lot to think about and a lot I've taken from this conversation that I will need to reflect on. But is there anything else you would like to add that perhaps we didn't cover and that could be helpful for myself or even people that are listening? No, nothing really comes to mind. Just try to keep an open mind and look stuff up especially other perspectives if you can. Yeah. Yeah. And looking stuff up is like I, what we've covered can be risky too, right? Depending on how technology is structured yeah. nowadays. Oh yeah. When I say look stuff up, I mean, look up the scientific literature, 
I know scientists get a bad rap at times, but really we just follow the data. We don't care if it's supportive of what we believe or don't believe. I've published stuff that can be interpreted as being more supportive of the left or the right. I've got a paper showing that uh, at some point the left comes full circle to the right and vice versa. Like, you know, we just follow the data and we try to tell the truth based on what the data tell us. I mean, we don't care if it's supportive or not supportive of our own personal beliefs or other people's. So, you know, don't be afraid to look up scientific literature, or ask someone who knows scientific literature, what's going on to help you understand it. Well, yeah, and I'm, I'll be doing an episode on psychometrics. So hopefully people can look at how to even evaluate data. So that'll be coming out soon as well. So, but I appreciate well, yeah. you hearing that. Um, I do give- Data literacy is very important. Yes, yes. And that's uh, an area that I don't think a lot of people understand fully and, um, and often even the way that data can be manipulated into conforming with someone's beliefs. Yeah. If you have enough data, you can pretty much show anyone anything you want to show them. Yeah. Um, I do give guests an opportunity to share, you know, their socials or ways to be contacted. I I'll leave that up to you if, if you want to do that, if not, that's fine too. But yeah, that's an opportunity for you. If you wanted to share that. I don't have any social media presence. I don't do anything on social media. My entire life is just my job and my family. Yeah. And that's, well, that's, I don't do anything else with social media or try to promote anything. Well, that's probably a safe way of oh, keeping yourself in check with all, all that data we've been talking about. That's one way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again, David. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to have the conversation and you taking the time. So, uh, I'm, I'm super grateful for that. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And. I hope that you get a lot more subscribers on your podcast. Thank you. Good luck with it. Thank you for checking out this episode with David. As always, please subscribe to the podcast so you can get access to all the episodes and much more. And also leave a five-star review. That's the best way to support this podcast. Thank you again. And until next week.